On Power Talk this week, we speak with Dr. James Mwangi, who is the Group Managing Director and CEO of Equity Group. They recently embarked on an Africa Recovery and Resilience Plan, and today we're going to hear all about it. So let's talk about the 700 billion shilling stimulus package. It's quite substantial. Could you take us through the objectives of this resilience plan? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. Uh, yeah, 700 billion reflects now the size of the bank. We've taken out of uh, 1.7 trillion Kenya shillings, 700, and said we'd like to initiate uh, a stimulus package for the development and transformation of uh, Africa. And we've built uh, a plan we are calling the African Recovery and Resilient Plan. And we are saying Africa needs to recover from the shocks of uh, COVID, from the shocks uh, of uh, the Ukraine-Russian war, and the current uh, headwinds uh, in the microeconomic shocks. But we wanted to recover and develop resilience. And that is then uh, paves way for Africans' transformation. This plan is predicted on bringing all partners and stakeholders together. It's an integrated approach. We have looked um, and we've realized there has never been a Marshall Plan for Africa. Everybody do their pieces. And as a result, we don't achieve a lot. So we brought in the Bretton Woods institutions, the development banks, the UN agencies, the national governments and the private sector together and said, let's have a coherent uh, plan for transforming Africa where we can collaborate and cooperate. Each do their best, each bring their capability and competitive uh, strength to the table. And together with all our hearts on the deck, then we may move uh, Africa. The rationale of this plan at this time is because there is an opportunity to reposition Africa. The world is where it was in 1947, when the current economic uh, and uh, political order was established after the Second World War. COVID has disrupted the world. The greening of the economy for uh, climate change has given an opportunity. And Africa seems to be the most well-positioned continent. So we are saying in the new setup, let Africa occupy its life to full position one, because by 2050, it will have 33% of all labor force on earth. It will have 25% of the total world uh, market in terms of population or consumer for that matter. It has 65% of all the unutilized arable land. So if you are going to solve the food security of the world, Africa must be on the table. And lastly, we will not solve the climate uh, uh, action issues without bringing Africa on the table because it has 60% of all renewable energy, whether it is uh, solar, whether it's weed, whether it's hydro, whether it's geothermal, 60% of undeveloped reserves are in Africa. So you can solve that problem by bringing Africa on the table. But you can't bring Africa on the table without listening to its voice. So the voice is the plan of Africa. So it's Africa inviting the world to allow it to participate in okay. development. Um, and, and it's interesting, you mentioned a Marshall Plan for Africa, and that's, you know, that's, that's great to hear. Um, could you perhaps give us uh, some insights into um, the strategies of this plan uh, in the various markets um, uh, you know, that Equity Group operates on the continent? <laughs> The plan is built around the big seven forces that are shaping the world. The first one is demographics. And uh, Africa uh, seems to have uh, the fastest growing population 
and a youthful age with a mean age of uh, 18. So we see Africa hosting labor. But it's not just labor, but the consumer market, uh, uh, that population. And it's anticipated, as we lightly said, to grow by 2050 to be 25 percent of the world population. The second one is the issue of deglobalization. We all believed in globalization, but COVID uh, taught us that the global supply chains don't work all the time. Uh, the issue of Ukraine last year taught us we can't be dependent on the global market. So there is an issue of deglobalization, and the only continent that can allow the world to deglobalize is Africa because it was not a participant. Whether you look at the girl culture, the world was not dependent on Africa. Whether it's manufacturing, so it's the only frontier that you could really uh, stabilize deglobalization and decentralization. The other one is digitization. The biggest beneficiary of digitization and technology will be Africa. Why? Because of a youthful population that is entirely a digital population or ge digital generation. And more importantly, Africa is more than 25% of the rad mass uh, of the world. So essentially, digitization will bridge the gap Africa experiences in logistics and infrastructure. We can do things online. And this then is in alignment with the African continental free trade area, one market. And so digitization really created that uh, Basho online uh, market. The fourth um, big is the question of uh, the politicization uh, of structures. Uh, the world is now uh, balanced between the West and uh, the BRICS uh, or the Asian uh, uh, Tigers. And the question is, where does Africa fall? Can Africa take uh, a neutral position and reset uh, geopolitics of the world so, and create a new order? where Africa uses its resources uh, to call uh, the world to order and say this is how the next order. So these are the parameters that has helped us to rethink, uh, including, of course, uh, the issue of decarbonization. If you are ready to decarbonize, then you require the resources of clean energy from Africa. Uh, you need uh, the lungs of the Congo forest basin for the world. And we're saying then if we knew these forces places Africa at an advantage, what would that advantage look like? One is the development of agriculture. Increase productivity in agriculture, but also increase the acreage and uh, which uh, we practice agriculture. And that then provides us an opportunity to trade with the rest of the world, not with agricultural commodities, but processed uh, commodities. The second one is our minerals. We have, for instance, 48% uh, of all uh, minerals uh, that are strategic in uh, fostering um, clean energy technologies. Why don't we add value, make the batteries on the African continent again? So when you combine uh, agro-processing and value addition uh, in our minerals, then we are able to create uh, a manufacturing base. And that manufacturing base then uh, allows us to create millions of jobs for our young people, increase value here, increase the taxes, which enables our government to provide uh, service. So that is the third pillar. The fourth pillar, of course, uh, is then we must increase our trade with the world because we are now fin uh, selling finished product. And that creates the pillar of trade and investments. We want to invite others to team us with us in manufacturing, in agro-processing, in value addition, in mineral, but we also to want to acquire their markets because they have established the market. But we don't want our people to be left behind. So we are saying micro, small and medium enterprises are the face of the African people. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you say that because I want to now understand, and, and you're starting to to bring that out, which is important to talk about the impact of uh, the access to the resources under this plan. What do you foresee as that impact specifically to individuals and to businesses as well? If we ensure that uh, access to those minerals is not uh, the way it has been of an extractive nature, 
if we do value addition on the African continent, three things will happen. The level of incomes will significantly increase because of value addition. If you look, uh, for instance, at uh, uh, mineral resources. At the moment, Africa gets uh, 11 billion dollars for its uh, strategic green minerals. If it adds basic primary value, that value goes to 50 billion dollars. If it does the finished product, that goes to 7 trillion dollars. So you could imagine if then the wealth became seven trillion dollars, the level of jobs that will be created in Africa, the wealth that will be created in Africa, will deal with uh, our poverty in one generation. But most important thing is the employment opportunities we create to uh, our young people. And that will stem the migration that we see across the Mediterranean Sea. We, uh, our people try to cross the sea to look for opportunity opportunities will be back at home and they will be building and developing uh, the economy. But it can't happen unless you formalize the small and medium enterprises so that they populate the value chains and the ecosystem of all these sectors so that the wealth is anchored in the people um, such that it is um, economics that is people-centered. Uh, if it is not economics that is uh, uh, people-centered, will create wealth without people becoming wealthy. So it, that is the link that we need. And that is where the greatest effort uh, is, formalize, capacitate, and de-risk those sectors so that they can apply. And that is where equity can really play a big role because it involves financing, it involves training, and we have both the foundation to provide uh, credit guarantees to the micro enterprise to train them and then the banks to provide uh, credit and insurance to secure the wealth that uh, we create. But as we finish that, we must ensure that these SMEs adopt modern technologies. The best way of doing this is to ensure we leapfrog on technology so that we future prove the future. We're not going to, and that then gives us the, as the competitive advantage. Others, when they are adopting the fourth industrial technologies and clean energy technologies, they have legacy systems they have to write off. We is uh, starting with a clean slate, and that is where the advantage of Africa is. So we are proposing that we use technology that protects these and create a competitive advantage. But as we do this, we need to bear in mind the adverse effect uh, uh, the agrarian revolution did uh, of um, uh, carbon em uh, creation, uh, emissions. And that's why we are saying then also let's look at what energy shall we use. And because we have 60% of all renewable energy, why don't we develop energy like Kenya did? 93% of Kenyan energy is renewable. So let's uh, develop our solar, our geothermal, our hydro, uh, and weed power so that this transformation and development of Africa is on clean energy, is on renewable energy, so that we don't pollute the continent and we don't. So those are the six pillars that make uh, the development plan. So as we have seeded it with uh, 700 billion, and we have 16 development banks coming on the table and saying we'll desyndicate with you, and when we uh, add up, we are adding up at 30 billion dollars of support. And that's some good support that we And that's a good to way to yeah. start. Yeah. We need much more. Yeah. But remember, the biggest funding is with the budgets of uh, countries. And we have aligned with the country. So for each country, we have developed a country development plan so that it anchors on the African plan, but takes cognizant of uh, the country's aspirations and uh, their competitiveness. Mm. And of course, then we are anchoring these on the African continental free okay. trade area. It's not going to look at the market. We are manufacturing for our 1.3 billion market population. So the issue of cross-border trade becomes very uh, important to think it through. But we are lucky. The East African community is working, the SADC is working. So take it them in blocks and then uh, put the blocks together to make up Africa.
Indeed, an elaborate plan for Africa, but also one that takes into consideration individual countries' strengths. So we're looking forward to the impact of this as you continue to roll out this Africa Recovery and Resilience Plan. Dr. James Mungi, thank you very much for joining us on Power Talk today. Thank you for having me.